Number 5. The Mary Celeste Our first entry on the list of ghost ships today is the story of the Mary Celeste, a ghost ship where the crew abandoned it for a reason no one knows. In 1872, the captain, one Benjamin Briggs, cast off out of New York's docks to travel to Italy. On board were the captain, his wife, their young daughter, and a small crew of eight seasoned sailors coming with them. The voyage seemed like a success until it was found by another ship, the Del Gradia. The crew of the Del Gradia approached the Celeste since it was barreling forward at full speed and full sail without anybody manning the crew. So the Del Gradia boarded it to investigate and found more questions than they had before as there was barely a sign of life. If they hadn't found it freely floating, they would have assumed the ship had just been built. There was a little bit of water in the hold and a lifeboat was missing, but other than that, the ship was fully intact. The hull undamaged, the hold replete with food and water and other supplies. So what happened? Why would the captain and the crew abandon a perfectly serviceable, well-stocked ship, especially one that was carrying his own family? Now there have been theories over the course of the years. Piracy is a fairly common suggestion suggesting they were attacked, but if the ship had been raided, why did they leave all the food and water behind and leave the ship freely floating? It's not like a pirate to leave anything valuable behind, anything at all. The ship was still on course to their destination, and the logbook found on board stated that the Mary Celeste was on the right path, so what happened there? They were going the right way. It's worth mentioning that before this strange occurrence, the Mary Celeste already had a checkered history. It was originally known as the Amazon before Jeff Bezos sued. No. It was the Amazon, but it was given a new name after a series of mishaps led crews to believe it was a cursed ship. The first captain died of an extreme sickness, and on one of the first voyages, the Amazon crashed into another ship. So it was renamed the Mary Celeste, hoping perhaps that a new name and a coat of paint could salvage its reputation. If only that was the case. The Celeste was recovered and sailed a few more years before being run down for insurance purposes, and to date, no one knows what ever became of Benjamin Briggs and his crew. And if you're looking for more ghost stories, not necessarily nautical, but ghost stories of any variety, Top 5 Scary has loads of that and then some. We've got just about everything freaky you can think of. So click on through and hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that bell. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got way more stories about haunted ships coming up for you right now. Let's get back into it. Number 4. The Jenny Way back in the era of exploration, when ships sailed across the sea, the South Pole was one of the most treacherous passes an explorer could make, and countless sailors sailed their last expedition around the Antarctic. One such ship is a small schooner called the Jenny. Now, we really don't know much about this ship, the purpose of its original mission, really even who was sailing on it. What we know of the Jenny comes from the post-mortem, when it was found discovered by a whaling ship in the year 1860. The hope was sailing through when it spotted a battered schooner, beaten but somehow still sailing around, passing narrowly through the gap between two icebergs. The crew of the Hope closed in. This was quite an odd sight. They recognized the English flag atop the mast and assumed the ship was in grave danger and needed immediate assistance, so they sailed on forward. They saw seven men standing on the deck, although they looked gravely underdressed for the weather conditions and not particularly active at all. These guys were sort of just uh, chilling out up there. It wasn't until the Hope sailed close enough that they realized the men they were looking at on the Jenny weren't just sluggish, but they were frozen remains frozen in place as if they'd been frozen flash solid as if it happened in an instant. They appeared to be in mostly good condition. I know that sounds incredibly bizarre to say that about a corpse, but they weren't showing signs of decomposition or any physical injuries. The Hope's captain, Captain Brighton, boarded the Jenny to try and understand what was going on here. He went underneath the decks and found a man slumped over a barrel with a journal in his hands. Brighton went up to touch him, but realized immediately like everyone else, he had been frozen in place. So he pried the journal from his cold, dead hands and read the last chilling entry. Chilling. I didn't even mean to say that. That was a little pun. That's what my comedy degree paid for. May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the last one alive. If the log was to be believed, then that would mean the crew had been sailing as corpses aimlessly for decades, as if not a day had passed. Captain Brighton took the journal home with him to return one day. And tragically, the wife of the Jenny's captain was found dead in the bedroom cabin alongside the ship's dog. The Hope sailed off with nothing more than the journal and left the Jenny floating across the frozen water where she may still be to this day, or perhaps she's plunged deep beneath the water. Wherever she is, 
I hope those men found some peace and hopefully some food. Number three, the Orang Medan. That's a fun name. In the 1940s, there was a widespread story about a ship named the SS Orang Medan that had exploded near Indonesia and its entire crew was found dead under mysterious circumstances. That's a pretty good ghost story. And like any good ghost story, there's a number of variants depending on who's heard what. Some claim that the Medan was attacked by a boarding party of rabid pirates, modern day buccaneers. Others claim that it was smuggling dangerous secret chemicals that poisoned the crew and caused the ship to explode. And of course, we're on top 5 scary. I love wild speculation, so I'll say I think aliens did it and who are you to tell me I'm wrong? It could be something paranormal. Interestingly, despite this story being so widespread and repeated, there doesn't actually appear to be many records of this ship. So did it really exist? Or was the whole thing just a ghost story altogether? It's believed that the ship was passing through the Strait of Malacca during the 1940s. And one of its first references was that of a passing ship that was said to have picked up a radio signal coming from the Medan. Reading out the very creepy message of We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in the chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. I die. That's something out of a Stephen King book, man. The vessel was an American ship called the Silver Star, and it went out to investigate probably the scariest message you could ever get at sea. What they found they couldn't have prepared themselves for. The entire crew was dead with, I quote, teeth bared with their upturned faces to the sun, staring as if in fear. The ship's dog had died too. But most bizarre was that none of these bodies showed any signs of a physical struggle. Some believe the ship had been carrying toxic materials and poisoned the crew, and that seems possible, but honestly, Given off of what I just read, that sounds way more like it's supernatural. I think demons were involved. If you've ever seen the movie Event Horizon, this seems a lot like it was an Event Horizon situation. Number two, the young teaser. So they called me in high school. Unlike a lot of other ships on this list that had served as merchant vessels, the young teaser, true to its name, was a bit of a wild card rebel as far as ships go, and was a notorious pirate schooner flying the black flag and was famous for its speeds. The young teaser had made a name for itself as a dangerous ship around Mahone Bay, notable for several successful raids, which is a lot easier said than done. I don't know if you've ever tried to board an enemy ship, it's very complicated. A whole lot wrong can happen on the ocean, and in the year of 1813, the teaser had met a match it couldn't outplay when it was cornered by a Nova Scotian officer by the name of Sir John Sherbrooke. Sherbrooke was a decorated military officer. He was a veteran of the War of 1812 and was looking to continue his path of glory, get another medal on the chest by capturing the teaser and its crew and bringing them back to the crown to face justice for years of plundering. Sherbrooke was ready to board the teaser, but he noticed that a privateer aboard it had already begun lighting their own ship on fire. Instead, the pirates had chosen to go up in flames rather than face the new back in England. Now, a pirate choosing death before capture isn't the most wild story. I'd wager a lot more pirates did that than Jack Sparrow would have you believe, but it's how the teaser's legacy carries on that gives it a spot on this list. Ask a Nova Scotian around the bay and they might tell you one of their most famous ghost stories. That on June 27th of every year, the otherwise peaceful Mahone Bay is overcome by fog, smoke, and the curdling screams of the damned crew whose souls are still trapped in the bay. They say on a real foggy night you can see the burning ship still sailing through. Some people even saying they see spectral sailors hanging off the riggings. Some boaters say that they see the ship charging towards them as if it was still marauding out and about, only when it's about to crash into another ship. It vanishes into thin air, leaving behind a cloud of smoke and fog in its place as if it was never there. And number one, the Carol Deering. Now we've been talking about ghost ships this whole video and you know, weird things that have happened to ships, ships going missing, but we've yet to bring up my favorite anomalous triangle outside of Bermuda. So let's fix that, eh? Let's talk about the ghost ship the Carol A. Deering. It was 1929 and the Deering was returning home from the Hamptons to Barbados, passing a Cape Lookout lightship. A man on the lightship called out to the Deering because he thought the crew looked aimless. They told him that the Carol Deering had lost its anchors, which I don't know if you know a lot about ships, that's a bad thing for a ship to lose. The Carol Deering kept making its way forward, I guess the lightship didn't have any anchors to lend out or anything, where it was spotted again a few days later by a ship called the SS Lake Elon, with its captain reporting that the behavior of the Carol Deering was very odd. He described it as steering a peculiar course. And that would be the last time anyone saw the crew of the Carol Deering alive. Two days later, the Carol Deering was discovered by the Coast Guard washed up on a nearby shore. 
The ship was missing its lifeboats and the decks were flooded. A rescue crew went in to investigate and were baffled by what they found. The ship had been picked clean. It was missing all its documents, all important equipment, belongings, it was stripped to the walls. The lifeboats and anchors were all gone and there wasn't a single sign of life in the ship with the exception of one oddity. A beautiful feast laid out for the entire crew that had been untouched. Not a nibble taken out of it. No one knows what became of the crew of the Deering. There's always been theories. Some people think maybe they mutinied against their captain and fled. Some people think they were taken by the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. Was their ship stolen? Or maybe they all just went home. We might never know. Coming at number five, we've got the MS Antonia Graza. What better way to kick off a list about ghost ships than with the vessel from the movie, Ghost Ship. Folks really love this one and come out in droves to sing its praises whenever possible. It's easy to understand why too. With an absolutely brutal opening sequence and plenty of phantom fun aboard a wicked Italian ocean liner, there's a little something for everyone. The mystery behind the ship's fate is a fascinating one too, revealed over the course of the flick to great effect. See, all we really know about this ghost ship at the beginning is that there's some sort of tampering that caused the entirety of the crew and passengers to be sliced in half by a very tense wire. The only survivor was a young girl as she was too short to be whipped in twain. Well, she survived the initial disaster, but being alone on a ship in the middle of the sea doesn't bode well for anyone. Decades later, a salvaged tugboat comes across the ghost ship and decides to give it a whirl. Upon boarding, they discover an enormous bounty of gold bars and an even more impressive collection of wayward spirits. They meet all sorts of ghosts who give them wishy-washy answers on what happened to them, all while some tugboat crew members are lured to untimely deaths by tricky spirits. Uh oh. This ghost ship keeps getting, well, more ghastly. It's a mystery right up until the very end, and even then there's more to discover. It's more than just ghosts aboard this ship, there are demons and soul collectors aboard as well. And if you think that's the end of it, well, I've got some news for you. It's not. If you want ghosts, mysteries, and ships, this is the movie for you. And even if just one of those boxes is something you want ticked, I promise it'll work quite well. So good luck, and uh, watch out for the ferryman. Seriously, that dude's bad news. Coming in number four, we've got the HMS Erebus and Terror. Now, this one's fun because it kind of crosses the line between history and fiction. If you're big into horror TV or horror novels, you've probably heard of this tale already, as it was adapted first into a book and then a popular series. Both known as the Terror, they take a look at the events surrounding a pair of particularly interesting ghost ships, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror. These did indeed set sail way back in 1845 on a a mission led by Captain Sir John Franklin. They were meant to explore the last unnavigated bits of the Northwest Passage to see if there was anything to be learned from the magnetic data up there. Unfortunately, both ships became trapped in ice in what one day would be Nunavut. Not ideal, right? Well, some theorize that the deadly cold and lack of supplies were only the beginning of the sailors' problems. There are many possibilities and variables when you put over a hundred men on a couple of ships stuck in a frozen wasteland. And for many years, nobody truly knew what their fates were. After being icebound for more than a year, the ships were abandoned. It's said that Franklin and many others had already died by that point. With that knowledge, the rest of the crew, including Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames, went out in search of land. They were never heard from again. More than a century and a half later, both wrecks were discovered and they're both regularly explored and studied. But what happened when the ships were stuck? Why did the crews wait so long before striking out for land? Were there really no other options? In the terror, a terrifying monster is introduced to keep the plot tense and exciting. Could such a creature really have appeared? Elements like madness and cannibalism are also introduced in the fictional retelling of this wreck, which seems like they could have played a part in the real life tragedy. Still, the tales from the ships are just as chilling now as they've ever been and the fates of all those who abandoned the ships at the end are still a mystery. Did they freeze and fall beneath the surface? Were they discovered by arctic predators? Maybe they were taken in by nearby tribes, never to return to their previous lives. Someday we may find out the truth, but for now, it's all conjecture. Coming in at number three, we've got the Wind Waker's ghost ship. Now we're back to some total fiction. In the most seafaring of the Legend of Zelda games, of course there's going to be a mysterious ghost ship to discover. Many folks looking back on their gaming experience recall this encounter with trepidation. It was freaky to find a ghastly vessel in what seemed to be a relatively cheerful game. 
especially when you couldn't actually interact with the ship without a specific chart. It would coast around the ocean, moving from place to place based on the position of the moon. Sailing at night became more of a thrill once you knew a ghost ship could cross your path. Worse yet, if you did have the appropriate chart and made it on board, you'd be greeted with plenty of skulls and a few enemies, which tells the tale of a very unfortunate crew if you ask me. Thankfully, there is treasure to be found on this ship and once you open it, the entire ship will disappear, with a really creepy laugh to boot. Unbeknownst to the treasure seeker, they'll end up unconscious on their boat afterwards. How'd they get there? Who did those skulls belong to? Where did the boat go? All good questions, but not all of them have good answers. Ask around and you'll just hear tales of terror. Apparently the person who put the ghost ship chart together died shortly afterwards, so you can't even ask for more details. Oh well, that's life. Or afterlife. Coming in number two, we've got the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. How does that old tune go again? A favorite of dads and policy majors everywhere. Well, we're not here to discuss Gordon Lightfoot, although it is a quality segue into this topic. We're here to talk about the largest ship to ever sink on one of the Great Lakes. This monolithic masterwork full of ore was famous for playing music all the time, which would entertain those along the shores when it passed through. However, it did meet a grim fate, and the story is still quite well known today. During a pretty routine trip, a hefty storm brewed. The captain was aware of this and sent some messages relaying the issues, but never a distress signal. However, that might have been helpful as during the voyage that ship sank and all 29 crew members perished. To this day, no bodies have been recovered. Nobody knows exactly what happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald. After years of examination and theorizing, many potential factors could have come into play. Some say that it may have been swamped, others claim it could have suffered structural failure or even been shoaled. Regardless of the actual problem, no no reports from the ship itself materialized, so it's possible we'll never know. And finally at number one we've got the Flying Dutchman. Anyone else have their first experience with this ghostly tale through Spongebob Squarepants? Only 90s kids remember, am I right? I'm gonna have to retire in shame after that one. Ignoring my tacky pop culture worship, let's talk about the actual ship, not the green tinted underwater ghost. For ages, mariners, sailors, and other water minded folk have told tales of the vessel that can never make port. Doomed to sail the seas forever, this craft is a portent of doom. If you see this glowing aberration while on an aquatic journey of your own, bad luck is sure to find you. The origins of the ship are hotly contested, ranging from vengeful pirate tales resulting in a cursed ship to a captain selling his soul for safe passage after ignoring warnings of danger. But one can be certain that the deck is loaded with the souls of criminals and ne'er-do-wells. If you hear cries of ow, 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 or spot a ghastly green light while sailing the seven seas, Good luck. Kicking off at number five, the SS Beichimo. Now, although many tales of ghost ships and their legend are mired in murky mystery and spotty historical records, this one is perhaps one of the most well documented cases of a ghost ship in nautical history. Built in Sweden in the year 1914, the SS Beichimo was used as a trading vessel for routes between Hamburg and Sweden in and throughout the First World War. After the war, though, it was shipped over to Canada, where it was employed by the Hudson's Bay Company, carrying cargo throughout the Arctic region. There, on October 1st, 1931, during a routine voyage, a devastating storm blew in, and the Beichimo was trapped in pack ice just off the coast of Alaska. The crew quickly abandoned ship, traveling over the ice to the nearest town of Barrow, Alaska, where they took shelter. Several days later, after the storm had subsided, the crew returned to retrieve their precious cargo, only to find that the SS Beichimo had disappeared. Her captain decided that she must have broken up during the storm and sunk, but a few days later, an Inuit seal hunter told the captain that he had spotted the Beishimo nearly 50 miles away from their initial position. As the story goes, the Beishimo didn't sink at all, and for several decades after her abandonment, she sailed the Arctic coast completely unmanned. In fact, the SS Beishimo was seen on numerous occasions throughout the following century, and several crews even managed to board her. In fact, the last recorded sighting was by a group of Inuit in 1969, a staggering 38 years after she was abandoned. Her ultimate fate? No one knows but it's safe to say that somewhere out there in the frozen north, the SS Beishimo is still sailing. Next up at number four, 
the Jenny. Now this one is a little bit murkier to say the least and historical accounts vary from person to person. One thing always remains the same though, if the accounts are true, then this nautical tale is perhaps one of the most bleakest and most despairing cases of a crew being lost at sea. As the story goes, the Jenny, an English schooner that set sail from its home port of the Isle of Wight in 1822, became frozen in an ice barrier just off the Drake Passage sometime in its voyage in 1823. Nearly a decade later, Later in 1840, the stark remains of the ship had been dislodged by the ice, only to be discovered by a nearby whaling ship. As some accounts tell, when the crew first saw the ship, they saw seven figures standing to attention on the main deck, and so thought that the vessel was manned. As they got closer though, they discovered the grim truth. The seven figures standing to attention were in fact frozen in place, turned to ice by the Arctic cold. Things only got worse from there though, and as the crew of the whaling ship explored the vessel, they found more and more bodies frozen in time deeper below the deck. As some reports go, as the crew came to the captain's cabin, they found him frozen in place with a pen in his hand. The final note written in his log read May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. Yeah, spooky stuff. Coming in at number three, the SS Valencia. Now, this one's a little bit more interesting to say the least because it's a verified fact that the wreckage of the SS Valencia can still be seen to this day, scattered along the beach and rocky shoreline of Vancouver Island's West Coast Trail. After the ship struck a reef during a storm in 1906, the wreckage of the SS Valencia was considered to be the worst maritime disaster along the western North American coast, otherwise known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. The Valencia was a small ship, a passenger steamer that had a long history of carrying both passengers, cargo and troops, but at the time of her ruin she was operating as a tour boat, often running routes from San Francisco and up to Seattle. During the wreckage, tragically 136 souls were lost with rescue efforts unable to access the Valencia in the ravaging storm. But our ghostly tale lies with those that tried to escape. You see, as the legend goes, in panic, the crew launched all of the Valencia's lifeboats, going against the captain's orders, all of which went horribly wrong. Three flipped on descent, dozens more capsized after reaching the water, and the last one disappeared out into the waves. Since the disaster of the SS Valencia, countless sailors and fishermen have reported sightings of these lifeboats listlessly floating upon the water during particularly calm days at sea. As some of the tales go, these lifeboats are still filled with the skeletal remains of the lost souls of the SS Valencia. Next up at number two, the Copenhagen. And it's quite the title really because the Copenhagen is considered by most to be one of the greatest maritime mysteries of the modern era, with only whispers, rumours and speculation as to its ultimate fate. Built for the Danish East Asiatic Trading Company in 1921, it was the world's largest sailing ship at the time and primarily served as a sail training vessel for young cadets. In the eyes of many, it was the most impressive sailing ship ever built. However, as the story goes, on September 21st, 1928, the Copenhagen departed from northern Jutland for Buenos Aires on its 10th and ultimately final voyage. A total of 75 people were aboard and the journey was planned to span all the way to Melbourne, Australia and then back to Europe. But tragically, as we know, it was never seen again. The thing was though, the captain of the ship, Hans Andersen, was renowned for going long periods at sea without sending any messages. And so it wasn't until nearly six months later that the Danish company sent a search party. No wreckage or remains have ever been found. However, following the next several years of the Copenhagen's disappearance, there were a number of highly reputable sightings of a five-masted ship that fit perfectly its description. In July of 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter sighted what they referred to as a phantom ship during a gale. Their captain noted in his records that this may be the wrath of the Copenhagen. Dozens of stories and tales have perpetuated around the ultimate fate of the Copenhagen, but the truth is we may never know. In all likelihood though, it's still out there, somewhere, floating on the endless tide. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the seabird. And this story is the literal definition of a ghost ship and one of the most saltiest sea yarns that I've heard spun in a while. Although this one has a few more twists and turns that you may not have first seen coming. As the legend goes, in the year 1750, a vessel named the Seabird was idling off the coast of Newport Harbour in Rhode Island and had quickly attracted quite a crowd on the shore due to its elaborate craftsmanship. Soon enough though, the crowd of onlookers noticed that there was something strange about the Seabird. There was no one manning the ship, not a 
soul in sight. As the legend goes, several moments later, the ship, as if by a supernatural wind, perfectly sailed itself through the rough breakers of the beach, gently landing on the nearby Easton's Beach. There, a few brave souls boarded the vessel, only to find the seabird completely deserted, save for a boiling kettle on the stove, and strangely enough, breakfast already prepared at the table. Now, some accounts state that a group of fishermen had passed the seabird a few hours before and had even spoken to the captain themselves. Where had the crew gone? What had happened in the few hours that had passed since their last sighting? The truth of it is that no one may ever know, and such is the nature of ghostly tales from the sea. But, well, this is where things get a little stranger still, and take this final caveat with a pinch of sea salt. But as the legend goes, decades later, an old sailor Taylor reported to a New England journalist his deepest, darkest secret. In a fit of rage, he had murdered his entire crew just before making port, throwing their bodies into the ocean. And the name of that ship? Well, the Seabird. Number five, the Octavius. The Octavius became more than just a legend in 1775 when a whaling ship named the Herald found it aimlessly drifting off the coast of Greenland. The scary part? With all of its crew frozen dead by the Arctic cold's mist and winds. Uh huh. To add to the spookiness, the ship's captain was even found sitting at his desk with a logbook in front of him, finishing a log entry from 1762. The Octavius was a legendary 18th century ghost ship. According to the story, the three masted schooner was found west of Greenland, boarded as a derelict. The five man boarding party found the entire crew of 28 below deck completely frozen solid, and almost perfectly preserved. The captain's body was supposedly slouched over the table in his cabin, pen in hand, with the captain's log in front of him. In his cabin, there were also the bodies of a woman and a boy covered with a blanket, and a sailor with a tinderbox in his hand trying to stay warm. The boarding party took only the captain's log before leaving the vessel, trying not to touch the remains or evidence of what possibly could have been the reason for the lost ship at sea. The last entry from the logbook was November 11th, 1762, which meant that the ship had been lost in the Arctic for 13 years. Can you imagine? 13 years of just traveling the Arctic, sailing slowly while frozen bodies lay still on board as a ghost ship? Yo, that's just like terrifying, okay? Like seeing a ghost ship sail up beside you from the fog, crystallized in frozen ice with the horrors that lay below the deck? Very sad, very sad, but also very scary, you know? Number four, the SS Valencia. Side note, if you like what we do here, make sure you always Hulk smash that like button or throw a comment down below. It really helps the channel out. Let us know what other ghost ships you know of and I'll check them out for a part two or maybe even a part three. Speaking of more ghost ships, the SS Valencia is one of the creepier ship stories. Pulling up and finding a completely abandoned ship is scary enough. Those are people's lives lost. It's scary stuff. The SS Valencia was an American iron hauled passenger steamer built for service in 1882 by William Cramp and Sons. It did many things. In 1897, the Valencia was attacked by a Spanish cruiser, Reina Mercedes, just off the Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. They tried to sink her, but nope, she was built strong and she survived. A year later, she became a passenger liner for the US West Coast where she served in the Spanish-American War as a troop ship during the conflict. Eventually, after her service, the Valencia was wrecked off of Cape Beale, the west coast of Vancouver Island, British Columbia on January 22nd, 1906, as her sinking unfortunately took 100 passengers with her. Some classify the wreck of the Valencia as the worst maritime disaster in quote, the graveyard of the Pacific, which is a famously known treacherous area off the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. That's a horrible nickname for a shallow area also, right? Like the graveyard? That's horrible. Six months after the sinking, a local fisherman and his wife reported seeing a lifeboat with eight skeletons in a nearby sea cave at the shoreline of Pachena Bay. The cave was reported to be around 200 feet deep. There was no definite explanation for the lifeboat's presence in the cave, but due to the dangerous seas outside the cave's mouth, the lifeboat along with its human remains couldn't be recovered. Local fishermen similarly report lifeboats being rowed by skeletons of the Valencia's victims just offshore as well. Most famous sighting? was a rescue ship named the Topeka. Some observers on board, who were survivors of the just sunken Valencia, claimed while sailing home with the survivors, a ship approached from the fog and the ship passing was the just sank Valencia. The crew on board apparently now all skeletons. Yo, I'm getting the curse of the Black Pearl vibes right now, are you? Like that's scary, scary. Number three, the Mary Celeste. We've heard about her. One of the most famous real life ghost ships, of course, is the mystery of the Mary Celeste. And I say mystery, 
because it's still a mystery. She was found drifting slowly through the waters of the Atlantic Ocean in 1872, sailing completely unharmed and untouched with all its sails still up, the crew's personal belongings intact, and a cargo of more than 1,700 barrels of booze untouched. She set sail from New York City with more than 1,700 full barrels of alcohol destined for Italy for distribution. On board were 10 people, including Captain Briggs, his wife, and their daughter. Over the next two weeks, the ship encountered, well, Something bizarre. Ten days later, the vessel was spotted by a British brig, De Gratia. The crew from that ship boarded the Mary Celeste and discovered it deserted. Yeah, no crew. Spooky. First thing I'm thinking is Bermuda Triangle. Always, always, always. Ghost ships, anything lost at sea, Bermuda Triangle, immediately. But apparently a British ship found the Mary Celeste on December 4th, 1872, near the Strait of Gibraltar. Sorry, right. so not, not the Bermuda Triangle then? No, no. all right. Yeah, it couldn't have been pirates either because apparently they like to drink stuff. It was apparently late reaching Italy and this British ship went out looking for her confused where she had gotten lost. The strangeness comes with the boarding. Below deck, things looked completely normal. Absolutely no signs of attack or struggle. The only things missing were one lifeboat, and the captain's logbook, and most importantly, the entire crew. Theories of crew mutiny, weather phenomenons like giant water spouts, or even consumption of poisonous foods came into play. After passing Santa Maria Island, the Azores, on November 25th, 1872, there were no more entries. Devoid of all crew, but strangely stocked to the nines with food and booze, and all the crew's personal belongings like jewelry and clothes. With no clear explanation, the Mary Celeste remains one of the most puzzling ghost ships around. They still have no idea what happened to those people. After the salvage hearings, Mary Celeste continued in service under new owners, but in 1885, her captain deliberately wrecked her off the coast of Haiti as part of an attempted insurance fraud. Number two, Lady Lovabond. A ghostly story of lust, love, jealousy, and rage. The dark history of this haunted love boat. In 1748, the day before Valentine's Day, it was set to sail as a celebration of the ship's captain's wedding. On February 13th, 1748, the ship contained by the newly married Simon Peel was carrying his new wife, Anetta, and their wedding guests from London to Oporto, Portugal. Unknown to the captain, his first mate, Rivers, was also in love with Anetta, and in a fit of insane jealousy, seized the helm after murdering the helmsman and deliberately steered the ship towards the Goodwin Sands, where it ran aground, cracking the ship in half and unfortunately drowning everybody on board. And there, the story might have ended, had it not been witnessed for all the claims to have seen the ghostly ship appear every 50 years. Some of them even passing close enough to hear the sounds of celebration. Apparently on the 13th of February, the Edenbridge spots Lady Lovabond's ship exactly 50 years later. It was reported seen by ship captain James Westlake, and according to his testimony, he almost collided with the ship before he could finally turn the steering wheel to avoid the collision. Dude, close call, just shows up out of nowhere? Like what? He also recorded in his logbook, the ship was headed straight for the Goodwin Sands. Other sightings have been reported at 50 year intervals, except for 1984, when the ship failed to materialize. 1798, 1848, 1898, and 1948 witnessed the ship's sightseeings. Even some boats sent out rescuers, assuming that it was in distress or lost at sea, but later it could never be found. Yo. A tale as old as time, huh? Jealousy, that'll do it. Yep, always does. And number one, the Flying Dutchman. In all maritime folklore, this ghost ship has left quite an impact like no other. It's the ghost ship. The oldest one in the book. Well, maybe not the oldest, but definitely the most prolific and well-known. The Pirates of the Caribbean, the Dead Man's Chest is literally the story of this. The legend, Vanderdecken, the captain, is on his way towards the East Indies with a confidence and determination. He tried to steer his ship through the horrid weather conditions of the Cape of the Good Hope, but failed miserably. Even after, of course, vowing to drift until his own demise, you see, he apparently signed a little deal with you know who. He swore that he would succeed through the perils of waves even if he had to sail until his judgment day. The devil apparently heard his oath and took him up on it and now the Dutchman is condemned to stay at sea forever. Legend says that since then, they have been cursed to sail the oceans for eternity. To this day, hundreds of fishermen and sailors from the deep sea have claimed to have even witnessed the Flying Dutchman, continuing its never-ending voyage across never-ending waters. The most famous sightings, I would say, is that of Prince George V of Wales. He was on a three-year voyage in 1880 with his older brother, Prince Albert of Wales, 
and their tutor. The prince's log records say the following for the pre-dawn hours of July 11, 1881 near Australia. Quote, 4 a.m. The Flying Dutchman crossed our bows. A strange red light as a phantom ship glow which lights the masks, spars, and sails of a brig 200 yards distant as she came up on the port bow but on arriving there was no vestige or nor any sign whatever of a material ship. Seen right away to the horizon, 13 persons altogether saw her. That's a prince writing so yeah that's a uh, pretty good uh, source material I'd say. This is horrific. Imagine a ghost ship faded by red light pulling up towards your ship in the middle of the night, then just cruises on by. Yeah, that'd be the uh, end of me, for sure. Kicking off at number five, the Caliuche. And for this first foray into these particular ghost ships that haunt the sea, we're going to be heading over to the mythologies of Chile and the many legends that have been built around its coastal landscape. One of those, according to Chilean legend, is that of the Caliuche, a large ghost ship that sails the seas of Chiloe, a small island just off the coast, where it only ever appears at night. The ship itself is said to appear as beautiful, cast in a bright white light, an enormous vessel with three masts and five sails each. It is said that when the Caliuche appears, it is always at night and always full of lights with the sounds of a great party and a feast on board. Quickly though, it disappears, plunging back beneath the murky depths. Interestingly enough though, although this vessel is said to be similar to the Flying Dutchman, there is a boatload of mythology relating to this particular legend. One of these versions claims that the vessel is crewed by the drowned souls lost at sea who are brought to the ship by three mythological figures in Chilean legend. Two sisters, one of them the Serena Chilota, a type of mermaid, and the other the Pincoya, a type of water spirit said to protect the Chilean coast. And then their brother, the Pincoy, their male counterpart who has the body of a sea lion. It's pretty cool. Once aboard, the perished souls can resume their existence in an eternal reverie of adventure on the high seas. However, there is a much more sinister version of this legend, which states that the crew of the Caliuche instead sailed the Chilo archipelago, luring fishermen and sailors toward it with an enchanting music to enslave them as part of their crew fraternity, where they are twisted and then contorted and put to work in their afterlife. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I prefer the first one, actually. Swinging in at number four, the Eliza Battle. And for this one, we're pinching the parameters of the Seven Seas, and instead, we're taking a look at one of the most notorious maritime disasters that instead of on an ocean, occurred on a river. The Tom Bigby River, to be precise, a stretch of water that runs between Columbus, Mississippi, and Mobile, Alabama. And here we have the legend of the phantom steamboat of the Tom Bigby. Back in 1852, one of the largest river steamboats constructed at the time, the Eliza Battle, was put into service between the two southern states. During one particularly cold February in the winter of 1858, after the Eliza Battle had departed the city of Columbus, the ship made its way down river, stopping on the way at Pickensville, Gainesville, Demopolis and several other small river landings. By the time that the steamboat had left off at Demopolis though, it was filled to the rafters with passengers. And not only passengers, but also over 1200 bales of cotton to be ferried to the final stop. Now, although it roughly still remains a complete mystery, around 2 a.m. on March the 1st, 1858, about 30 miles downriver from Demopolis, the crew of the Eliza Battle awoke, startled to discover that the cotton bales on the main deck were on fire. Flames soared and quickly engulfed the ship's hull, soon spreading out of control despite the frigid temperatures attributed to the odd, gussy evening. The boat continued onward though, the entirety of the exterior completely engulfed in flames and cut off from their lifeboats. The passengers, many of them who had awoken dressed in their night clothes, were forced to plunge into the icy river below. Now, some of them survived mainly by floating atop the remaining cotton bales, but all in all, over 33 people lost their lives, both crew and passengers included. The Eliza Battle quickly sank beneath the water, the wreckage of which still lingers at the bottom of the Tom Bigby River. It is said that on a particularly cold and windy night, the Eliza Battle will emerge from the icy fog engulfed in flames once again, a warning sign of an oncoming ill omen. Next up at number three, the fire ship of Bay de Chaleur. Which, I mean, come on guys, that's probably the most awesome sounding title to anything on this historical list, right? The fire ship of Bay de Chaleur sounds like something that Geralt of Rivia himself would sail down to Skellig after a summer in Toussaint, but whatever, that's by the by, because this vessel in question actually takes us over to the eternally autumnal eastern tones of New Brunswick, Canada. Now, the fire ship of Bay de Chaleur is also more commonly referred to as the Chaleur Phantom or the Phantom Ship 
ship and it often takes the form of a series of ghost lights just before a storm appearing as a large three mast galley. Now the actual mechanics of this phenomenon are dubiously debated and many believe it's caused to be down to either the weather phenomenon of St Elmo's fire or an undersea release of natural gas after a patch of rotting vegetation just off the New Brunswick coast. I mean that's a completely different story entirely but what we're concerned with is the actual origin of the fire ship, the history of which is equal parts tragic and gruesome. As the legend goes back in 1501 a Portuguese captain had spent a year pillaging the coast of Bay de Chaleur capturing Micmore natives for the slave trade. However his cutthroat agenda was miscalculated as a year later when he returned to the region on his second voyage he was captured, tortured and killed by the Micmac people in revenge for their kidnapped tribesmen. The legend didn't end there though because a year later the brother of the Portuguese captain sailed to the bay in search of his missing sibling and upon seeing the same flags the Micmac people attacked the ship setting it ablaze whilst it was moored in the bay. Cut off burning and with certain death facing them the sailors swore to haunt the bay for a thousand years as their blazing fire ship sank into the bay of Chaleur. Now whilst later both Micmac and Portuguese casualties washed up on the shores of the island the bay itself is said to be haunted by those that perished often appearing as distraught sailors and warriors their flesh burnt by the fire ship. Swinging in at number 2, the Princess Augusta. And on the topic of ghostly phenomenon, this particular apparition is perhaps one of the most well documented ghost ships of the 18th century, although the actual history behind it is shrouded in intrigue. Although the folklore account of this particular vessel is based upon the historical wreck of the Princess Augusta, a ship that sailed out of Rotterdam in August 1738 under the command of Captain George Long, in more modern records it is commonly referred to as the Palatine, where the Palatine Light, the apparition in question, famously gets its name. And the reason for that is down to the nature of the ship. Alongside 14 of his crew, Captain Long's directive was to transport 240 German immigrants from the Palatinate region of the Rhineland to build a new life for themselves in Philadelphia. However, we know that this is the tale of a ghost ship and from the offset their vessel was afflicted with some terribly tragic luck. Not long after passing through the Atlantic the Princess Augusta's water supply was contaminated causing a fever and flux to spread through the ship killing 200 of its passengers, half the crew and the captain himself. The ship's first mate Andrew Brook quickly took command as the survivors leapt out of the frying pan and into the fire getting hit by severe storms that pushed the ship far off course to the north. They then endured three months of extreme weather and dwindling supplies when eventually they emerged shipwrecked in block island not far from Rhode Island. Here the tale splits but one thing is certain, Andrew Brooke the first mate and commanding captain took what remained of his crew and rowed ashore without once looking back at the cursed ship. It is said that some of the passengers survived aided by the block islanders but little to nothing is known about those that survived the entire voyage. As the legend goes the princess Augusta was set alight from the coast in the dead of night, pushed out to sea to burn and then disappear. At night they say that if you listen closely you can hear the screams of those that didn't make it back to shore. And finally coming in at our number one spot, the Duke of Danzig. And for our most terrifying ghost ship on this list, of course it has to be a brutal and bloodthirsty pirate ship, a privateer that plundered her way across the Caribbean, notoriously in the name of her royal namesake, the Duke of Danzig. This ship's seafaring career was relatively quiet for the first few years of service, mainly acting as more of a letter of mark, a deterrent more so than a private man of war. However, her fate quickly changed after changing command and sailing under the French captain Francois Aregnadeau. Now his intentions were to sail and plunder his way across the seven seas and plunder he did from Liverpool to Barbados capturing and scuttling more ships than he could count on his way. However despite being a vessel of the French empire strangely enough sometime after late June 1812 the Duke of Danzig just disappeared although there are several records catching a glimpse of her around Canada but she was never seen again. After the last mention of her it was thought that she'd been destroyed by a tropical cyclone or sunk in the night after an encounter with a British frigate. However, as the legend goes, that was not the last of the Duke of Danzig. After the golden age of piracy had been sated, a captain by the name of Napoleon Galois relayed his records of a French frigate encountering the wreck of the Duke of Danzig drifting listlessly at sea. As his crew witnessed, the ship itself was covered from helm to hull in dried blood and in staggered rows were the putrefying corpses of her crew, many of which were brutally crucified to the masts or the deck. Strangely enough, there were no signs that she had been in 
in recent battle. In fact, despite the blood, she was pristine, no shot holes, and her sails and rigging intact. After searching the ship, Galois' crew found a stack of blood stained papers, identifying the captain as the same Francois Aregnado. And then, as they left, the crew of the frigate set the brig ablaze, forever to be buried at sea. Kicking off at number five, the SS Beichimo. Now, although many tales of ghost ships and their legend are mired in murky mystery and spotty historical records, this one is perhaps one of the most well documented cases of a ghost ship in nautical history. Built in Sweden in the year 1914, the SS Beichimo was used as a trading vessel for routes between Hamburg and Sweden in and throughout the First World War. After the war, though, it was shipped over to Canada, where it was employed by the Hudson's Bay Company carrying cargo throughout the Arctic region. There, on October 1st, 1931, during a routine voyage, a devastating storm blew in, and the Beichima was trapped in pack ice just off the coast of Alaska. The crew quickly abandoned ship, traveling over the ice to the nearest town of Barrow, Alaska, where they took shelter. Several days later, after the storm had subsided, the crew returned to retrieve their precious cargo, only to find that the SS Beichima had disappeared. Her captain decided that she must have broken up during the storm, and sunk, but a few days later, an Inuit seal hunter told the captain that he had spotted the Beishimo nearly 50 miles away from their initial position. As the story goes, the Beishimo didn't sink at all, and for several decades after her abandonment, she sailed the Arctic coast completely unmanned. In fact, the SS Beishimo was seen on numerous occasions throughout the following century, and several crews even managed to board her. In fact, the last recorded sighting was by a group of Inuit in 1969, a staggering 38 years after she was abandoned. Her ultimate fate? No one knows, but it's safe to say that somewhere out there in the frozen north, the SS Beishimo is still sailing. Next up at number four, the Jenny. Now, this one is a little bit murkier, to say the least, and historical accounts vary from person to person. One thing always remains the same, though. If the accounts are true, then this nautical tale is perhaps one of the most bleakest and most despairing cases of a crew being lost at sea. As the story goes, the Jenny, an English schooner that set sail from its home port of the Isle of Wight in 1822, became frozen in an ice barrier just off the Drake Passage sometime in its voyage in 1823. Nearly a decade later, Later, in 1840, the stark remains of the ship had been dislodged by the ice, only to be discovered by a nearby whaling ship. As some accounts tell, when the crew first saw the ship, they saw seven figures standing to attention on the main deck, and so thought that the vessel was manned. As they got closer, though, they discovered the grim truth. The seven figures standing to attention were, in fact, frozen in place, turned to ice by the Arctic cold. Things only got worse from there, though, and as the crew of the whaling ship explored the vessel, they found more and more bodies frozen in time deeper below the deck. As some reports go, as the crew came to the captain's cabin, they found him frozen in place with a pen in his hand. The final note written in his log read May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. Yeah, spooky stuff. Coming in at number three, the SS Valencia. Now, this one's a little bit more interesting to say the least, because it's a verified fact that the wreckage of the SS Valencia can still be seen to this day, scattered along the beach and rocky shoreline of Vancouver Island's West Coast Trail. After the ship struck a reef during a storm in 1906, the wreckage of the SS Valencia was considered to be the worst maritime disaster along the western North American coast, otherwise known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. The Valencia was a small ship, a passenger steamer that had a long history of carrying both passengers, cargo, and troops. But at the time of her ruin, she was operating as a tour boat, often running routes from San Francisco and up to Seattle. During the wreckage, tragically, 136 souls were lost with rescue efforts unable to access the Valencia in the ravaging storm. But our ghostly tale lies with those that tried to escape. You see, as the legend goes, in panic, the crew launched all of the Valencia's lifeboats, going against the captain's orders, all of which went horribly wrong. Three flipped on descent, dozens more capsized after reaching the water, and the last one disappeared out into the waves. Since the disaster of the SS Valencia, countless sailors and fishermen have reported sightings of these lifeboats listlessly floating upon the water during particularly calm days at sea. As some of the tales go, these lifeboats are still filled with the skeletal remains of the lost souls of the SS Valencia. Next up, at number two, the Copenhagen. 
And it's quite the title really because the Copenhagen is considered by most to be one of the greatest maritime mysteries of the modern era with only whispers, rumours and speculation as to its ultimate fate. Built for the Danish East Asiatic Trading Company in 1921, it was the world's largest sailing ship at the time and primarily served as a sail training vessel for young cadets. In the eyes of many, it was the most impressive sailing ship ever built. However, as the story goes, on September 21st, 1928, the Copenhagen departed from northern Jutland for Buenos Aires on its 10th and ultimately final voyage. A total of 75 people were aboard and the journey was planned to span all the way to Melbourne, Australia and then back to Europe. But tragically, as we know, it was never seen again. The thing was though, the captain of the ship, Hans Andersen, was renowned for going long periods at sea without sending any messages. And so it wasn't until nearly six months later that the Danish company sent a search party. No wreckage or remains have ever been found. However, following the next several years of the Copenhagen's disappearance, there were a number of highly reputable sightings of a five-masted ship that fit perfectly its description. In July of 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter sighted what they refer to as a phantom ship during a gale. Their captain noted in his records that this may be the wrath of the Copenhagen. Dozens of stories and tales have perpetuated around the ultimate fate of the Copenhagen, but the truth is we may never know. In all likelihood though, it's still out there, somewhere, floating on the endless tide. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the seabird. And this story is the literal definition of a ghost ship and one of the most saltiest sea yarns that I've heard spun in a while. Although this one has a few more twists and turns that you may not have first seen coming. As the legend goes, in the year 1750, a vessel named the Seabird was idling off the coast of Newport Harbour in Rhode Island and had quickly attracted quite a crowd on the shore due to its elaborate craftsmanship. Soon enough though, the crowd of onlookers noticed that there was something strange about the Seabird. There was no one manning the ship, not a soul in sight. As the legend goes, several moments later, the ship, as if by a supernatural wind, perfectly sailed itself through the rough breakers of the beach, gently landing on the nearby Easton's Beach. There, a few brave souls boarded the vessel, only to find the seabird completely deserted, save for a boiling kettle on the stove, and strangely enough, breakfast already prepared at the table. Now, some accounts state that a group of fishermen had passed the seabird a few hours before and had even spoken to the captain themselves. Where had the crew gone? What had happened in the few hours that had passed since their last sighting? The truth of it is that no one may ever know, and such is the nature of ghostly tales from the sea. But, well, this is where things get a little stranger still, and take this final caveat with a pinch of sea salt. But as the legend goes, decades later, an old sailor reported to a New England journalist his deepest, darkest secret. In a fit of rage, he had murdered his entire crew just before making port, throwing their bodies into the ocean. And the name of that ship? Well, the seabird, of course. Coming in at number five, we've got the Mary Celeste. Don't be tricked by the lovely name, this ship is no fair maiden. Maybe it was named for one, but that's got nothing to do with their ghostly tale. This tale is a tragic one indeed, and one that seems ridiculously risky by today's standards. A captain decided he wanted to make the trip from New York to Italy aboard his ship, the Mary Celeste. Had he decided to bring a super experienced crew and a bunch of cargo, that would be one thing, but this not nautical journey was no such business trip. Instead, he decided to bring his wife, two-year-old daughter, and a crew of seven. That's a small group of people for such an extensive journey, especially when bringing one's family along. But everyone boarded the ship regardless and headed out to sea. Their journey should have been about a month, but they never arrived in Italy. Instead, another ship known as the Di Gracia came across the Mary Celeste, floating aimlessly in the sea. Assuming the worst, the crew of this new ship went to see if anyone was still aboard, but they were never able to help anyone as the ship turned out to be empty. But it wasn't totally gutted though. There were still plenty of supplies in the larder and the ship itself was still in pretty good shape. Sure, there was a bunch of water on the deck, but it wasn't like it was gonna sink anytime soon. Stranger still, the lifeboat was gone with no indication as to why or where it was heading. So there the Mary Celeste was without a captain, crew, or family drifting in the Atlantic. It became one of the most famous ghost ships of its era too, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle drew inspiration from it and used this inspiration to write his short story, J. Habakkuk Jeffson's statement. This tale was a launching board for many theories, from pirates to mutiny to cold-blooded murder. 
The thing is, nobody knows for sure what actually happened. The captain, his crew, and his family were never heard from again. Now, there are some more realistic theories that have come forth about the inexperienced captain not knowing the full extent of damage to his ship and ordering everyone maybe prematurely onto a lifeboat at the first sight of land. Even so, that likely ended in tragedy as well as the lifeboat never made it to shore, or so we think. And with all those supplies still on board and the ship not going down anytime soon, it feels a bit like an ironic tragedy now, doesn't it? Coming in at number four, we've got the Kobenhaven. Five masts, and none of them prevented the ship from going ghost. You'd think it would be easier to spot that way, but hey, unlike our last ghostly tale, this ship was jam-packed with capable sailors. Well. Partly anyway. The Copenhagen was known as a training ship, which would often take a fair number of cadets. They would learn how to best run the ship so that their subsequent journeys might go a little smoother. One would assume that a training ship wouldn't be subject to overly harsh conditions, just like how any training is supposed to lower the risk of failure during a real life scenario. Unfortunately, this was not the case. 60 sailors marched aboard this well-fitted ship and once they departed, they were never seen again. The ship had all anyone would need to succeed, including plenty of lifeboats, an auxiliary engine, and a wireless communication system. So what went wrong? Nobody really knows. It left the Rio de la Plata on December 14th, heading to Australia. On the 21st, the crew was in touch with another ship and all seemed to be well. After that though, they went totally silent. Some think they ran into an iceberg, others claim that it could have been something more sinister. Either way, darkness and fog definitely played into the equation. For years, the Copenhagen was missing in action with nothing to show for it. However, some sailors did claim to see a phantom ship with five masts sailing the seas. Now, the ghost crew hasn't attempted to communicate with anybody yet, nor has anybody been able to get close enough to confirm what they've seen. But you'd better believe those cadets are seasoned sailors by now. Back in 2012, a wreck was discovered that many believe to be the Copenhagen. However, this still goes unconfirmed. Coming in at number three, we've got the tale of the Jenny. Now, the tales I've told up until this point have been mysterious indeed. The fates of the folks on board are up in the air and may never be fully explained. The story of the Jenny is just as mysterious, especially because it's been contested by a few folks, but the fate of the crew, if you believe the story, is more cut and dry. Or should I say, uh, frozen and wet. In this unsubstantiated story of oceanic horror, the crew of a ship named Hope came across what appeared to be a ship in pretty good shape. From a distance, there appeared to be crew members working on the deck. This struck the crew of the Hope as a little strange as the Jenny had been missing for many years. When they got closer, it all started making sense though. The men they had seen atop the ship were indeed still there, but not alive. Each one was frozen solid, met with a frigid end. Yikes. Things got worse when the captain of the Hope decided to check out the inside of the ship where he found more frozen corpses. The Jenny's captain was discovered frozen to a chair with a journal nearby. The final entry in his log read, no food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. That one sentence carries all sorts of latent horror with images of more than two months without food in a horrible frozen environment. One has to wonder if any crewmates became food for the survivors and what life must have been like as hope faded by the day. Coming in number two, we've got the Baron Falkenberg. Here's a general rule for life. Don't kill your brother and his bride. If you can't abide by that, maybe you deserve to be carted out to a ghost ship and doomed to roam the waters until time immemorial. The good Baron was unable to follow this seemingly simple rule and ended up in a less than savory position. The story goes like this. One day, after being missing for quite a while, Baron Falkenberg's brother returned home. Folks were quite pleased with his return and the brother proposed marriage to a lovely young maiden the Baron himself was interested in. At the their wedding feast, the Baron lost his temper and cracked his sibling over the head with a bottle, killing him. The bride-to-be was terrified and ran off, but the Baron pursued her to confess his love. This didn't go over very well, and the woman told the Baron that she'd rather be dead than be with him. A very literal man, the Baron interpreted this dramatic retort as a request, and he stabbed her. Realizing the grave mistake he'd made, the Baron fled to the beach, where he found a man with a dinghy waiting. This man told the Baron that the captain was waiting for him and rowed out to a much larger ship off the shore. From there, the Baron boarded the ship and for the past half a millennium, he's remained on board. 
This ship always seems to be heading north, flickering with blue flame and filled with skeletal sailors. And finally at number one we've got the Palatine. Forget the Block Island sound, we're talking about the Block Island light. If you ever find yourself around Rhode Island between Christmas and New Year's, take a look across the water at night. It's said you might see an old ship blazing against the darkness. There are many stories about where this ship came from and none have been officially confirmed. Some say that the crew had come down with a terrible illness and the captain would not let them go to shore. Others say that folks from Rhode Island lured the ship to the shoals in order to take what they could from it, killing the remaining passengers. And then there's the alternate version where the locals actually rescued the folks on board and nursed them back to health. So why is the ship on fire in the ghostly apparitions then? Well, apparently a woman was left on the island by the ship and eventually came to be known as a witch. She got her revenge on the vessel by imagining it on fire and cursing it for leaving her alone. This idea became more popular and now the story involves a flaming ship. Starting us off at number five, we have Yellow Jack. We're gonna set sail on a weird one to start us off. If you're a flag enthusiast, you might see the ending of this one coming from a mile away, but we'll get there in a minute. So the legend of Yellow Jack starts upon a spice and gold filled ship preparing to leave the Indies and head back home. The crew was accounted for, the cargo was secure, the captain was feeling Mwah, nice. Then, at the last second, a mysterious figure asked if they had room for one more. Feeling pretty good about their haul, they welcomed this extra pair of helping hands on board. Wrong move. Turns out this was a disreputable lad known as Yellow Jack, with a reputation so abhorrent that the ship was forbidden to enter any port she called upon. For ages, the crew sailed from port to port, hoping that someone would let them dock, but it never happened. They were forced to endlessly cruise the seas, running lower and lower on supplies. Patience, too. Eventually, the crew went mad and committed mutiny before they all murdered each other. Some say the ship is still sailing, the ghosts of these sea locked sailors manning the helm. Someday they may find a port that will take them and they will finally be able to rest. In the meantime, they will sail the seas, infecting other ships with the same madness that Yellow Jack caused. Now this is a spooky, ghostly story in its own right, but it could also be a reference to a different ship killer at the time. Disease. The Yellow Jack is a flag flown by ships infected with plague, cholera, and other nasty, fast spreading diseases. So, Yellow Jack itself could be a metaphor for disease, and ports weren't letting them in because of quarantine procedures. Absolutely fascinating, and it would also make a killer movie. A pirate quarantine body horror. Think The Thing meets Wreck meets Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh damn. Coming in at number four, we have the Caliucci, a Chilean ship sailing around an island known for its terrible storms. Shining white sides, three masts with five sails, blood red. The ship sails independent of any human input. Sure, there's a ghost crew, but the Caliucci is known for being sentient. The ship has a mind of its own, it'll glide along the water at incredible speeds and is able to submerge and continue navigating underwater, similar to the famous Flying Dutchman. When it passes, folks say you can hear the crew cackling for a brief moment. It's a ship known for the merriment of its ghostly crew. They throw parties often and hop around on one leg. The folks on board often only have one leg because the other is folded behind their back, similar to another Chilean mythological entity. Top off their strange looks and mannerisms, some crew members have backwards faces, terrifying all who lay eyes upon them. Some say the Caliucci is manned by sailors both dead and alive, dragged from the depths and snagged off passing ships. Another legend says that the ship is piloted by the souls of the drowned, brought aboard by water spirits and granted the gift of life in exchange for their servitude. Not so sure that's a good deal, you know, life eternal but you'll always be on a stinky ship. Maybe the parties are just that sick. Merchants who trade with Caliucci supposedly become very wealthy afterwards, and anyone who has laid eyes upon it wears a crooked smile forever. Again, interesting deal. Lots of money, crooked smile. I guess you could afford a dentist and some plastic surgery at that point. Coming in at number three, we've got the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait. Yes, Canadian ghost pirates. That pretty much sums up my career aspirations right there. I don't know if that means I would be pirating software related to ghosts or actually becoming a phantom upon the Northumberland Strait, but I don't really care as long as my title involves the words Canadian, ghost, and pirate. 
But back to the actual tale at hand. This ghost ship is said to sail when it's on fire within the Northumberland Strait. What is the Northumberland Strait? It is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in eastern Canada. Now you all know some Canadian geography. I'm so proud of you. The story dates back over 200 years when people started reporting a beautiful schooner catching fire and being engulfed in flames as people watched from shore. Anyone who has ever attempted a rescue mission finds that the ship completely disappears before they can reach it. Apparently the ship shows up before a northeast wind for warning terrible storms. Some say it's just an example of St. Elmo's fire, a rare weather condition involving the ionization of air molecules in order to produce a faint glow, but those who have seen the ship ablaze say that it was much too bright to be explained away like that. The prevailing story is that a pirate made a pact with the devil to protect and hide his treasure and in return he and his crew would sail forever on the burning ship. A pact was made as the ship was burning down and would soon sink along with the treasure. In the end, folks claimed that their fate was revenge for the terrible deeds they had done in their days of piracy, like their own personal floating hell. Coming in at number 2 we have Baron Falkenberg. A tale of lovers scorned, brothers bashed and dice rolled. This pirate haunts Germany's North Sea and has been for over 600 years. Baron Falkenberg was a relatively wealthy member of high society, planning to propose to the village's most beautiful maiden. Then his long lost brother returned with newly found riches and proposed to her first. At the wedding, the Baron became so upset with his brother that he clubbed him over the head with a bottle of champagne. Classy. Naturally, the brother dropped dead. Seeing this, his bride ran away, claiming that she'd rather die than be with the Baron. Ouch. So the Baron did what any rational fratricidal maniac would do and stabbed her in the heart. How romantic. Then he ran away to the beach where he was accosted by a shady man on a boat. This mysterious figure invited him to the ship where he came from, which was anchored offshore a little ways out. The Baron accepted and rode his way to the great grey behemoth. Since entering nobody has seen him disembark and he's been at sea for centuries. The ship he boarded always seems to be heading due north and flickers of blue flame. Some passers by claim to have seen the Baron himself playing dice with the devil in order to take back control of his soul. Unfortunately, it appears to be very difficult to win a game of chance against the devil. An additional caveat that can be added is that there are those who will claim that the story of the Baron is also connected to a Norse ghost story. The story tells the tale of a viking sea captain who stole a magic ring from the gods. As punishment for his crimes, he was turned into a living skeleton covered in fire, condemned to spend the rest of eternity affixed to the mast of a ghostly longship. Whether the two stories are about the same ship, it's hard to say. However, I think we can all agree that a flaming skeleton pirate is pretty badass. And finally at number 1 we have the Flying Dutchman. We saved the most well known for last. The legendary ghost ship is said to glow with ghostly light as it sails the seven seas. It will attempt to send messages to land or to people long dead if hailed. Unfortunately, nobody really wants to hail this ship as the sight of it is seen to be a portent of doom. Like most ghostly ships, the Dutchman can never make port and is doomed to sail the oceans forever. It's theorized that the spectral seafarer had been rounding the treacherous Cape of Good Hope when it encountered a sudden storm. The hatches were battened down and the captain swore he would push right through come hell or high water and it turns out a little bit of both were on the menu. For his recklessness with his ship and crew, the captain was divinely punished. He was condemned to sail the seas for eternity, serving as a warning to other mariners of bad weather and the cost of hubris. Sightings of the Dutchman have been reported since the 18th century with many notable scallywags and scurvy dogs laying eyes on the ghastly vessel. Even Prince George of Wales described seeing a ship glowing with a strange light. If you see a ship with skeletons dancing in the rigging, steer clear. It might look like fun, but the captain will try to lure other vessels onto the rocks to ensure nobody else can pass the cape. Sheesh, remind me not to take a long sailing trip.